class, welcome to um, uh, chapter two, part two of this screen castomatic. I just before we move on, I just want to review a, a few key points from uh, part one. Uh, number one is that um, students are not automatically placed into special ed if they have needs. There is a pre-referral process that is really captured by um, uh, RTI, Response to Intervention. We've talked uh, uh, about the three tiers that consist uh, or that uh, comprise that, that model or that process, and it's important for you to understand what occurs in each one of those tiers. Now, one of the things that I want to emphasize is that <clears throat> many of you are interested in um, teaching or working in the regular classroom, whether it's elementary, middle, or high school. So there are um, many, many students who have disabilities uh, that will need uh, additional support. And it really, um, uh, although there's a team that will be working uh, with the classroom teacher to help meet those needs, it's really the responsibility of the classroom teacher uh, for those students, for example, that have reading disabilities or math disabilities, uh, to support the student and to provide the strategies to help the student um, improve, be successful, and perhaps uh, not enter um, special ed or not receive those services if there's not a need. So I just want to emphasize an important point and an important role of the classroom teacher. Um, before a student is put into special ed. Now the second chart <clears throat> is a way of chunking some information and um, if we go back to the um, previous chart from uh, part, two, part one, you'll notice that I've outlined the three tiers and we have a description of what's included in those tiers and, and rationale. So <clears throat> if we take a look at Justin, you know, we know that Justin uh, perhaps uh, has gone through Tier 1. He's uh, been uh, placed, uh, the pre-referral team thinks that he should have Tier 2 um, resources. That's additional time, more frequent progress monitoring, probably a specialist that might be working with him or an additional teacher. We find that in Justin's case, um, Tier 2 does not work uh, after a couple months of progress monitoring, so we move to Tier 3. Uh, uh, he still receives instruction in the regular classroom, 90 minutes, but receives an additional 60 uh, for his area of need and perhaps one-on-one -on -one instruction and his progress monitoring uh, is done on a, a much more frequent basis. Now let's say that <clears throat> Justin is still having trouble. Well then the pre-referral team would meet, they would look at all the data from all the uh, tiers, from all the interventions that the classroom teacher has uh, done, and then they would talk about whether or not there's a need for comprehensive for a comprehensive assessment. In other words, is there something going on here with Justin that is beyond um, the classroom uh, level, that is be beyond the uh, capacity of the classroom teacher to be able to address? And when we were talking about Juanita Pope. And you know, there's probably a really strong potential there that there uh, were issues beyond what a regular classroom teacher could handle. So <clears throat> pre-referral team meets and um, they may suggest that a comprehensive assessment be, be conducted. So if we go to that second line, a comprehensive uh, assessment is a, um, well, it's just what it says, a comprehensive assessment. They'll assess the achievement level of Justin. Um, they'll test his academic. There may be some behavior issues related. Uh, oftentimes there are. Students that, have, that struggle academically oftentimes have uh, behavior issues. They'll get a, um, uh, some, some sense of what his IQ would be. They might even get um, um, information from a doctor. He might, uh, uh, physical may be required. So there's a lot involved in the comprehensive assessment. And this is something that a school psychologist uh, would, would handle uh, or would facilitate. And uh, because of the specific nature of the assessment and the, uh, the scales that are associated with the assessment, this has to be handled by a, uh, a specialist. And <clears throat> let's say that Justin um, 
is given a comprehensive assessment and uh, perhaps that assessment might determine that Justin qualifies for special ed. And if that's the case, then an um, individualized education plan or IEP is developed and um, they'll determine what um, placement will be best for Justin. And they'll, with that IEP, there are several, we'll talk about IEP in just a little while, but there are many um, things that have to be considered uh, relative to the IEP. So these two slides really kind of represent the sequence that occurs uh, from a student who is at risk, having difficulty, up to the point where a um, student might need special education. Okay, so a, a little review here. At Tier 1, students are screened through the use of a screening assessment. It's usually a curriculum-based assessment um, that kind of assesses where that student should be relative to the curriculum that they're in. Um, we look for research-based instruction, effective instruction, and um, students are, are monitored uh, probably uh, three to four times a year, all right? Now, in Tier 1, we could still have students that have difficulty, and so um, accommodations, modifications might be made to help uh, those particular students. But if we've done, if a teacher has done tier one correctly, all right, and let's say someone like Justin is still having trouble, again, we move to tier two where we add additional time, smaller groups, probably have a specialist, and the progress monitoring is done more frequently. And if we continue to have trouble over, the, over a couple months, every district kind of sets that timeline uh, differently, but uh, it has, you, uh, teachers have to have time to implement these interventions uh, or um, there's really no use in going through the interventions. Justin still has trouble, then we move to tier three. Uh, again, more, more time, more intensive instruction, uh, perhaps one-on-one, -on -one, and then from there, the possibility of a comprehensive assessment and uh, moving into um, possibly special education, okay? And there's the graphic that illustrates the tiers, okay? Now, up until just a few years ago, states were given um, the opportunity to just use the discrepancy model. That's, again, the difference between um, an IQ score and their regular achievement through achievement tests. But <clears throat> IDEA, IDEA states that states uh, could utilize a process to, to, that determines whether a child responds to research-based interventions. So the state uh, does not say must, but many states, uh, including Georgia, is moving uh, to that RTA or RTI as opposed to discrepancy model. Right. So <clears throat> one way to kind of check your understanding of the tiers is um, uh, for each tier, tier one, tier two, tier three, what types of strategies are used? How is the instruction carried out? Um, how much time, when, where, and who? How often does progress monitoring occur? And what happens is if the interventions don't work? So based on the information that we just covered, you ought to be able to answer um, those questions. For number one, you certainly can't give specific strategies because we haven't covered those yet, but we will. But you can say something about that, that the strategies should be research-based. So <clears throat> if I were you, I would get out a piece of paper and I would take some time and move through each tier and answer these questions or create a uh, concept map or a chart that uh, in which you can um, assess yourself as to your understanding of the RTI process, okay? Now, <clears throat> a quick little review. Justin's mom is aware that Justin has not yet qualified for special ed, but she knows that steps are being taken to determine whether he might become eligible. You are planning to meet with Justin's mom to explain RTI to her. Provide a response to the three questions um, she'll be asking. So. Justin's mom wants to meet with you. She comes in. She wants to know what 
what is RTI. Now, we know that Justin's mom um, um, probably does, does not want to go to school. She's probably uncomfortable meeting with you. Uh, RTI is a pretty complex concept. So as a teacher, what would you do to help explain what RTI does? Would you use a graphic? Would you use a model? Um, uh, how, would you, how would you do that? Um, another question would be, uh, how will RTI involve Justin? What's his role in that process? Oftentimes we just think about the adults, but it's very important to uh, involve the student as well. And to give the student an understanding, if Justin's a fourth or fifth grader, he kind of understands what's going on. So being able to explain the process to him is important as well. <clears throat> what's the relationship between RTI and special education uh, eligibility? Okay, and uh, again, you should know how to answer that question. And then the fourth one would be any questions that um, Justin's mom might have. All right, so this is a, um, a chart um, that's blank, but it, it if you look at the top, it tiers, whether or not screening is, is involved, uh, the focus of instruction, uh, the progress monitoring, how often, and whether an IEP is involved, okay? So you can take a look at this and um, kind of maybe try to fill that in on your own. And then if you go to the next slide, you, you can see how that would be um, filled in. If you have any questions about this chart, this is a good way to kind of assess yourself as well, um, then feel free to bring those to class. We know that at Tier 1 we're going to have screening, right, three or four times a year. Um, the um, pre-referral team may meet if we have somebody has trouble. Um, we know that screening is not involved in Tier 2, but we do know that progress monitoring is involved in Tier 2. And uh, again, you can kind of look at that on your own. Okay, um, just some key terms that you'll need to, to know. Um, this is the only uh, class related to exceptional learners that you'll be taking. So familiarity with the language of the field is really important. So when we talk about a screening assessment, we're looking at um, an assessment, <clears throat> usually in a short duration of time, and uh, to determine whether or not students might have trouble in a particular area. And there's a wide range of screening assessments that can be used. Again, most districts have screening assessments, instruments in place, used about three to four times a year uh, to determine who, which students may or may not be at risk. Progress monitoring, again, I use the word dipsticking, but quick, easy measures to um, see how students are progressing. And again, if students having trouble uh, with comprehension, uh, we might be doing fluency checks on a regular basis. We might be checking uh, the student's rate of reading. Uh, we might be checking their um, ability to comprehend. So there's a, a variety, any area that you can think of that might cause uh, reading difficulty. Uh, a progress monitoring tool can be developed. And um, oftentimes these are developed by teachers, but sometimes they are commercial as well. Many districts have moved to um, commercial progress mon monitoring instruments because uh, they can generate a computer printout and um, um, can classify or can more easily illustrate where a student might be. Now, curriculum-based assessment, uh, again, is a form of progress monitoring in which a teacher would actually develop an assessment based on the, the materials that she, he, he or she is using in the class, okay? <clears throat> now, if we were to take a look at the RTI process, if we kind of zoom out and we would try to um, define what that process looks like, uh, it would look something like this. It's called the Plan, Do, Study, Act, Slash, Redo process. And this <clears throat> process applies to many, many things, not just uh, RTI. Actually, it probably applies 
to what you do uh, in school and your studies, maybe what, are you, what you even do uh, in trying to live day to day. So <clears throat> let me take you through um, that process. Um, so we have a student, let's say we have uh, Justin, and let's say that Justin is at tier two, all right? So <clears throat> the first thing we're gonna do is plan our interventions. All right, what are the things that we're going to do to help Justin improve and what are particular areas he's having trouble in? Uh, what's the group size gonna look like? Who's gonna be doing it? How often are we gonna progress monitor? All right, what goals are we gonna set? How do we know when Justin has met those goals? So that's the planning part, all right? Now the doing part would be actually implementing the tier two intervention, actually putting those into motion to see um, how Justin does, all right? And then after a period of time, it might be one month, it might be two months. Again, the pre-referral team can kind of determine that. Um, we, a team would get together and study the results. Is Justin moving forward? And that's where those trend lines, those charts are very, very helpful. Or is he having trouble if he's stuck, right? Uh, <clears throat> if he's moving forward, then, um, um, then we move to the last uh, quarter there, act or redo. And well, actually, if he's having trouble or if, he, if he's successful, we move to the next, next uh, quarter there, next quadrant. So we study the results and we make adjustments. Uh, Justin may be doing just fine. He's got a, um, a tra trajectory, trajectory that shows that he's being successful with the current strategies. So we might pretty much keep that plan in place, maybe make some adjustments. But let's say that we're seeing that Justin is having difficulty, is having problems. And so we would adjust that plan, uh, find out what we can do to help him be successful. And then we would start the cycle all over again, okay? Now we're talking about the plan, do, study, act, or react or redo process. I'd like you to think about the role of the teacher and everything that the teacher does uh, follows this um, this process. Uh, the idea of um, developing a lesson plan, the idea of implementing the lesson plan, the do piece, and perhaps the most important is that uh, the idea of studying or reflecting on how did the plan go, how did the implementation go, is uh, so important. Now that, <clears throat> that ability to reflect and study increases as a teacher uh, gains experience. Um, but it's a, it's a critical piece of the process. And we talk about teaching as an art and science. We look at that study piece you know, when we're looking at data, we're looking at student performance, that really is kind of the science of our teaching. But <clears throat> what you do with the, the data, what, we, what you do with the information really is the art um, side of um, the role of a teacher. And then of course, uh, redesigning and uh, implementing or redoing a plan based on your results finishes out the process. So I hope you understand how this works. If you have any questions about it, please uh, jot, jot the questions down and we'll cover them in class. Now, <clears throat> advocates of uh, response to intervention uh, <clears throat> say that RTI reduces the number of students needing special education. So I'd like you to think about <clears throat> the discrepancy model versus RTI and why <clears throat> with RTI might that be true? Why might RTI reduce the number of students needing special education? Now, RTI is a relatively uh, new concept. I'd say probably it's been around for the last 10 years. And as a result, there's little research at this point that illustrates its effectiveness. But um, um, uh, there is a lot of ongoing research relative to 
RTI and its effectiveness. A lot of that research is coming out of the uh, University of South Florida. Uh, a gentleman by the name of Dr. Batch, B-A-T-C-H-E, I believe. IDEA, the third arrow there, provides the option for states to use RTI as an identification tool. Okay, so as we mentioned, <clears throat> RTI is not a mandated um, identification tool. Uh, some states still use a discrepancy model, but it is an option, uh, and it's a growing option among the states. And <clears throat> this whole idea of RTI um, moving from tiers, um, uh, designing different types of strategies, uh, increasing the intensity of the strategy as students move up the tiers. All of those have implications for improving instruction. Okay, so one question that I would ask, a real basic question in terms of um, the beginning, uh, a beginning way to look at your class and to begin to look at the idea of differentiating instruction is you have five students in your classroom, five students are reading below grade level, three are classified as learning disabled, they have specific learning disabilities, say in the area of reading, and two are gifted students. What structure would you use to begin to organize your students for instruction? So based on what you know uh, from chapter two so far, what organizing structure would you use to begin the instruction? Now, if that's not clear to you uh, or you're not sure, please jot that down so we can cover it in class. We have an activity that we'll be doing when I get back. It's right there. All right. Um, <clears throat> another consideration is before a teacher makes a referral. Uh, there are many other ways that a teacher can gain information about a student. Can examine the school records, uh, and in those records you'll have information about uh, their achievement tests, you'll have medical information, you'll have report card information, uh, you might have midterm report information. So there's a lot of information that you can go through. You'd want to check to see whether or not the student has had a previous psychological evaluation. You might want to check to see whether or not the student qualified for special services. In other words, some of the students might have, a student may have qualified for a Title I program, which would be, which would indicate that the student may have been, um, may have had some reading difficulties. Has a student been in other uh, programs? It might be an after-school program. And um, how did the student score on standardized tests? And has the student been retained before? So there's a lot of key information that you get from what we would call the cumulative folder. Now, uh, that information is confidential. Most schools will not allow you to take the folder out of a particular room, or they'll allow you to take it to the classroom, but you have to check it in before you leave in the evening. So, uh, but there's a variety of information that's available for um, teachers to draw from. Have you spoken to other professionals about the student? Have you spoken to the teachers um, below you to see how they've done? Have you spoken to the teachers that um, teach um, PE or art or music? How is the student doing in those uh, other class settings, okay? Now, <clears throat> as we've done in chapter one, there's a checkup there and uh, I'm going to let you go ahead and go through. I'm going to click through those really quick. Um, I believe you have the answers for those as well. All right. Now we're going to go to our second question. How, how is the intent of the law implemented? Okay. So we've talked about <clears throat> the steps that we take um, prior to having a student ex uh, receive exceptional um, learning services, but what about the point where the student has been uh, been through a comprehensive assessment and now is entitled to those services under IDEA? What does that look like? Okay. 
So the primary intent of special education law in subsequent reauthorizations of IDEA has been reauthorized several times, in other words, updated, um, because the field of um, special education is changing constantly, and IDEA represents the federal uh, guidance for special education, uh, is to always focus on the needs of the students using a multidisciplinary team, okay, in other words, a group of people, developing an IEP, and the IEP, this is an important point to keep in mind, is a legal document that describes the services a student is going to receive, all right? Now remember that idea of due process, that parents have an opportunity to, uh, in a sense, really challenge the school district if they feel that the IEP is not meeting the needs of the students. Again, that falls under the idea that IEP is a legal document um, for parents and for the school system. <clears throat> so if we were taking a look again um, at the idea of IDEA, we have a couple, um, and the IEP, we have uh, components that are very important in understanding what an IEP is. If you look at the left-hand side, we call it PLOP, or present level of performance, at which level is a student presenting it, present, presently achieving. So a question that I would ask you is, why is uh, PLOP, why is a present level of performance? Uh, knowing that, why is that important? What does that enable a teacher to do? Uh, how could school systems use that information? You know, in <clears throat> The IEP is also going to have something called a statement of measurement goals. You know, uh, what are the academic or if you are a student that has um, intellectual disabilities, in other words, a low IQ, low ability, what are the functional targets that you'll enable the student to access, to enable the student to access the curriculum? In other words, um, PLOP is where is the student? Statement of goals is where do we want that student to be? Now, the third aspect is the assessment of the goals. How are the goals going to be measured? All right, and that's a really critical piece. Oftentimes, again, you'll have somebody that has a special ed background that will guide the classroom teacher through this process. It's, um, I believe, highly specialized, and so you need someone that really understands um, what a measurable goal is. You need someone that understands how to effectively assess those goals. And then um, the fourth category is what services and support are you going to provide for that student? What accommodations, what testing accommodations, what supplemental aids or supports, uh, what instructional materials are, or is that student going to be um, uh, being able to have access to. It also would determine whether or not a student will be leaving the classroom for a period of time to go to a specialized class. So the services and support piece is very important. And then the last piece is accommodations. What accommodations will be made for testing purposes? And these really kind of relate more or less to the state uh, assessments. Again, as we mentioned uh, earlier, um, uh, most students who have disabilities have to take a state assessment, but there are some that are exempted from certain parts of the test or else they're given a test that is um, different in format than what regular students take, okay? Okay, now let's continue with the uh, IEP and legal requirements. Again, uh, one, two, three, four. Those five on the left-hand side represent the first part of the IEP. Those are the components that have to be addressed in the IEP. And we continue on. Um, another component is what are the instructional related services inside the classroom? Uh, is it cons consultative, collaborative, co-teaching? In other words, um, if we have another teacher that's being brought in to assist a student, uh, is that teacher coming in just to kind of consult 
with the classroom teacher to see how the student is doing? Or are the teachers working together, actually um, uh, collaborating on the behalf of the student? Or is there co-teaching uh, involved? Oftentimes people see collaborative and co-teaching as the same thing. But what's the role of other people who are involved with that particular um, student? And then instructional related services outside the classroom. Um, again, um, this is where the idea of a separate class kind of comes into play. Or a student, um, uh, as I mentioned, the idea of Crest School, the idea that the student may go to a... Some students have severe um, um, disabilities or they've been in an accident. They may have home instruction. Um, some may be in the hospital. They might need uh, hospital or homebound instruction. <clears throat> then the next component is the extended school year. Will the student receive services over the summer? Yes or no. Most school districts provide services for students with special needs uh, over the summertime to help, help them keep pace. Uh, and also to help address the needs related to the IEP. Um, documentation of notice, that means that uh, the parents are involved and sign off on the IEP, as does uh, parent participation, documentation provided to parents, okay? So these represent, these two slides really represent all the components of, of an IEP. Now, IEPs differ from state to state, but generally these components are, you can find them in uh, an IEP from Florida, you can find them in an IEP from Georgia. They're pretty consistent across the United States. Now, when a student eight reaches the age of 16, this is an important point, um, they begin to look at how do we transition that student from high school into post-secondary uh, whether it is um, employment, whether it's education, whether it's independent living skills. So uh, at the age of 18, um, the student must be involved in the development of that IEP and making those types of decisions. Um, and we have something at that point called transition services. In other words, how are we going to help that student uh, move from high school to either post-secondary education, training, uh, or employment. Now, the makeup of the IEP team is um, uh, not a whole lot different than the team, that your pre-referral team. Now, you'll have the, the parents of the child with a disability. You'll have a minimum of one regular education teacher, uh, one special education teacher, and that's, again, minimum. You'll have a district um, LEA, which means local educational agency. That might be somebody from the district. It could be a principal, could be an administrator, but usually someone else that represents the district in special ed. Um, you'll have someone, usually a um, psychologist, who can interpret the evaluation results, and you'll have other people with special expertise. So you can see that the size of the group can be uh, quite large, so it's important who's ever facilitating an IEP process to make sure that the right people uh, are there. And um, um, again, they're used to doing that, and that's their, their job. And if a child is 16 or older, then they need to be there as well. Okay, now, one of the activities that we're going to do when I get back is we're going to look at an IEP and try to work on it together. <clears throat> Some other fine points related to IEP. Um, the needs of the student must be carefully assessed. Team of individuals must be working together for the student. Goals and objectives must be stated clearly and are achievable. And the IEP, this is a really important point, must be written after evaluation, in other words, after the comprehensive evaluation, if that evaluation determines that the student needs special ed services, that's when the IEP is made. And then after the IEP is developed, then um, a placement is made. So uh, 
IEP is like in between the evaluation and the placement. Individualized family service plans. These are um, basically uh, programs uh, for students that may have special needs, physical therapy, speech, language, medical services, uh, those who are under five. And transition plans is on, uh, is on the other end of the spectrum. 16 uh, beyond, they need to have a transition plan to move into either high schooling, employment, or independent living. Okay, so, <clears throat> so a quick review, we know that <clears throat> when we're looking at um, education law or IEP, parents have to be involved. We know that um, it's important to utilize research-based instruction. In other words, instruction that has proven um, to meet the needs of students, and we must use that instruction in a way that expresses fidelity. Um, prior to uh, um, being in uh, special ed programs, most states will go through a uh, RTI process, response to intervention using the tiers. The core curriculum uh, still is a very important part of students' curriculum. Uh, most students' curriculum, even if they have disabilities, uh, many of them um, still go through that core and um, RTI processes are designed to help students be successful at that level. Progress monitoring, or dip sticking, I think you have a pretty good idea of what that is. Um, and then the problem solving method would be the plan, do, study, act method. I didn't mention that earlier, but when you see the term problem solving method, that's the plan, do, study, act process. Okay, and this next chart is just a review And again, um, what I've done here on these slides with the red background, uh, these are just review slides going back over Tier 1, Tier 2, and um, RTI team, Tier 3, what progress monitoring means, and then we have our checkup. Now, the reason why I have these review slides is that it's very easy to get uh, RTI process with R, with IEP process confused. So I want to come back and review the RTI so you know the difference. We'll talk more about those differences uh, in class. And again, we've got some checkups there for you. And then we're going to move to um, the next part of our uh, chapter two. And that will be uh, chapter two part Three. So I'm going to stop this right now and um, let you collect yourself and then we'll begin probably the last part of chapter two.